the theatrical community. And it is because of the loyalty, loyalty and respect of the American Theatre Wing that we are able to bring the quality of people that we have to share their knowledge, their experiences, not only with each other, but with the audience that is here. The seminars are just but one of our year-round programs. Perhaps we are best known for the Tony Awards, but that is a thing apart. What makes the Tony Awards so important is the work that the American Theatre Wing does. We speak theatre. We bring theatre to hospitals, to shut-ins. We bring professional theatre so that those who can't go out continue to have the experience of live people talking to them and being part of them. We bring theater to the Saturday Theater for Children, and it is exactly that. We bring professional theater to children in their own schools on Saturday mornings. And perhaps I think the most important part of this is the fact that the children make a commitment to go to the theater. They buy a ticket, they line up, and they know on Saturday mornings they're going to the theater. And this is a habit that we hope will last a lifetime. They don't go to the theater because it is a big event, that it is an anniversary or a birthday. They'll go to the theater because they need it and because they've been reared on going to the theater. This is the future of the theater. Today, we talk about the playwright. We talk about the playwright's words coming to life with the director. I think perhaps it, the group today speaks for the very beginning of theater. Without the word, there is no theater. Without the director to bring the performers to life, to see that the words are as they should be, there is no theater. And so we've heard from the performers, the performers who said how they get into the character. They read what the playwright has said. They listen to the other characters. They immerse themselves into the words. And then comes the director to help them bring them out. I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm president of the American Theatre Wing. And today's panel will be on the playwright and the director, and co-chaired by Jean Dalrymple, who is author, has director and producer, member of the board of the American Theatre Wing, and Brendan Gill, critic, wonderful, wonderful man, good friend, and member of the board of the American Theatre Wing. And they, in turn, will introduce our panel today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. As Isabella has indicated, we are gathered here today on the side of God and man <laughs> to uh, join these playwrights and directors together. Uh, if any know just cause why these should not be joined together, <laughs> let him speak now or forever after, hold his peace. On my father's right is Richard Maltby, Jr., the director, director, among other things, of the Glass Menagerie, Long Day's Journey into Night, Street Songs, uh, a man who was also uh, in the theater as, uh, in, in other capacities, has adapted and contributed uh, lyrics to Darlin Jr., has been a director of Ain't Misbehaven, which received a Tony Award, uh, was director and lyricist for Baby, which received a Tony nomination, and uh, is also the presiding uh, one of the presiding geniuses of the current song and dance. And next uh, to Richard is Marsha Norman, who authored the plays Getting Out, Third and Oak, The Hold Up, Circus Valentine, The Laundromat, Night Mother, and Traveler in the Dark, as well as the author of numerous scripts for television and films. And uh, she is, we are proud to say, a member of the board of directors of the American Theatre Wing. And at my immediate right is Shirley Lauro, author of The Contest, Margaret and Kit, Nothing Immediate, The Cold Diamond, and Open Admissions. And among the published works are I Don't Know Where You're Coming From at All, Set Up, and a novel, The Edge. Jean? At my left, way down there, I have one of the most famous couples in the world. I hardly need to mention their names, but I'm sure you've all seen them and known them. Tom Jones and Harvey Schmidt. And I hardly need to say that they are the authors of the longest-running musical in the whole world, The Wonderful Fantastics. I'm sure everybody in this room has seen it many times. I know that I have. 
the question that's often asked me about you two is, which does what? Or do you do <laughs> everything together? <laughs> Tom Jones is, is the first good-looking man, I, I and the second is Harvey Schmidt. Oh. <laughs> we never cross over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, next to them is uh, Clinton Turner Davis, who is with the Negro Ensemble Company. And uh, he's a stage manager. And I think he does a lot of other things, too. He's, uh, he's well known for his work on uh, Nevis Mountain Dew, Zoo Man and the Sign, Plenty, the American premiere, uh, a soldier's play, which was marvelous and made into a film. Uh, and he's been the director of A Season to Unravel, Brontosaurus, Two Can Play, and Air Guitar. And right next to me, is a man I never met before, I don't think, and I've always wanted to. Oh. Herb Gardner. <laughs> and the reason is that when I saw A Thousand Clowns, I said, the writer of that must be a darling man, because there's a quality of that in everything that he writes, like the present show, uh, which uh, we talked about yesterday, I'm Not Rappaport. You remember, we, we had the two stars, Cleavon Little and Judd Hirsch, and uh, we all spoke most glowingly of you and of your lovely plays. And now I think we're going to start asking real pointed questions. And Brendan, you're very good at pointed questions. Uh, quite a bit. <laughs> the, uh, yesterday, Barnard Hughes was mentioning among the actors' tasks, the occasional necessary task, as he believed it to be, of having to fill in what he calls certain black holes in a text of a play where either purposely or not purposely, the, the playwright has not given uh, the actor what the actor, and Barnett at least felt, Barnett Hughes felt, uh, was uh, any particular direction uh, in, in, in respect to where we should go, how we should feel at that particular moment. And then afterward, we were thinking about the possibility that, 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 that there are two kinds of, of playwrights. Uh, Eugene O'Neill, he was saying, of course, left nothing to chance. Everything is spelled out so intensely and at such great length, in my opinion, by O'Neill, even in his directions, <laughs> uh, that, that, that uh, Barney Hughes felt it was very easy to follow O'Neill and difficult to follow other kinds of playwrights. But Marcia, if I were to begin with you, do you uh, have a sense of wanting to leave, as say 18th century musicians and composers would leave things to be embellished uh, by the performer, or are you you eager to write a very tight script in which nothing can be left uh, to the actor in that sense. I'm eager to write that kind of script, but I, I'm not quite capable of it. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that the acting uh, company of today um, w would even uh, allow such a thing. I mean, today we have a ruling spirit of, of collaboration, and I think it's both our strength and weakness in the contemporary theater. Um, I think that uh, I know, for example, that some of the most interesting productions that I've seen of my work have been when people have completely ignored the stage directions. Um, I also know that the most humiliating moments in my life have come when people have ignored the stage directions. Um, what, what, I, what I'm feeling now, and, and this is truly an as-of-this-moment feeling, I'm feeling now that we need to return to our separate disciplines in the theater and strengthen those in whatever way we can. Um, I'm beginning to believe in the dead playwright uh, approach to things, um, which is that you write it and you do the best job you can and then you um, sit in your house um, and read while they produce it. Uh, and then you go and take a look. And you learn and you chat with them. Uh, and what you are able to see by doing that is truly what they have contributed and, and on the other side, what you have done. Um, so often in the current collaborative scheme, it's very difficult to tell who has done what. Um, and you can think it's their fault just because they're not you. Um, what I feel is that we have, we have writers coming into the theater now who, as Richard and I were just saying, are, are very uh, weak in matters of structure and craft uh, and come to depend too much on the actors to fill in. Actors don't know about structure. They know about having a good time on the stage. Um, 
And if you can write the structure that allows them to have a good time on the stage, then you have a great evening. Um, but when we, when we expect to, to, be, to cover for each other, then we're in trouble. Um, so it's, I'm coming out on the other side of, of the intense collaborative scheme now and saying, let's work separately for a while and see what that does. Now, Herb, your work always strikes me as having a sense of playful uh, improvisation of, of, of making uh, joyful leaps from, from point to point, A to B to C. Uh, and therefore, I would guess that you would want to work collaboratively, unlike Marsha, but am I wrong? I, I, I guess I feel just as Marsha does. Um, and in fact, one of the things that, and I don't know if it was your experience with, with uh, Night Mother, uh, that, that it, uh, I felt these people, it was their performance and it was their play, those two terrific actresses. But it was very clear that there was, there was a ship they were on mm -hmm. uh, that was supporting them. And um, I like to feel in my stuff that there is a, an appearance of freedom and everything, but that, that organization, there, the, there, there is, um, there's that church and state separation, which I think is important, and I've, I, I, I have as probably I'm only aware, work with many of the same actors over and over again because we've gotten used to each other and our, what we demand from each other. Uh, there was one seminar in the last year, I don't think it was here, where uh, John Guerra said, I think about my favorite playwriting thing this, of the last couple of years. Um, he, there was a, a, a director talking about having said that she worked mostly with dead playwrights, and he asked, how did they die? <laughs> um, the truth, though, is that unless your work can survive your death, you know, <laughs> you might as well not be doing it. I mean, I always feel that ultimately I'm working for, for publication, in fact, so that it can, can reach people in all corners yeah. of the world and, in fact, survive you. Now, what about that's that's it? just the thing, though. As Marsha is saying, it. I've had uh, it's it, it, it. What she's saying sounds so much like all the feelings I've had. I, I've seen my stuff where I've had nothing to do with it at all, and felt uh, it was uh, like one production of a play of mine that I went to see in Paris, uh, uh, people I had never met, uh, uh, and it seemed clearer than any version I'd seen of this play. Uh, uh, and and the other way around. But I, but I do think of the dream play in my head, uh, of that place, that 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 desk, in which um, the um, I at least hope for the collaboration of myself. <laughs> <laughs> On a good day. In the musical theater, I think there there is more collaboration. Well, and it's, the, the problem is infinitely more severe, I think, even in the musical theater because it's even more expensive. There's more writing on it. There are more people involved. There's even more diverse elements, being with orchestrators, orchestra, usually a lot more scenery, a lot more things happening. And there's a great tendency to want to, and necessity to put power in the hands of one person. With that, Unfortunately, in my opinion, over the uh, last couple of decades, because of that necessity, there has grown into being a concept of the director as the original creator who hires in, jobs in writers, composers, just as he jobs in uh, actors, designers, whatever. I think that's extremely unhealthy and I think will lead to uh, a very barren longevity, really, uh, may have an, a, a production that's very exciting. But the theater is the last place, really, where the words the, and the, the music, the, in, in the case of a musical, where the writer is the ascendant force, as opposed to film or something like that. And that's one of its attractions, really. I, I, would, I, I deplore, in the musical theater, uh, directors taking over. I mean, I love the idea of collaboration. It's great. I also think that what one should do is just like 
do as compressed, as complete a job as you can, and leave room, leave air for them to, for the actors to create. Don't explain everything, and don't, you know, and let them add. But uh, it's gone way beyond that in the musical theater. Um, Richard, do you yeah. feel <laughs> that uh, what Herb is just saying about church and state, that the director is, is often a kind of mediator between these two things? Well, uh, I'm very schizophrenic on the subject, because um, when I'm writing, I'm uh, a tyrant, and I'd like to work out every detail and have total control and completely anally <laughs> control it all. And the moment I go into rehearsal directing something, I completely reverse it. It's as if another person inhabits this body, and I release it the other way in order to get as much back from the, from the creative people that I'm dealing with. However, I guess because I'm a writer too, a part of me is editing their contribution all the time. So that I live somewhere in, in, in the middle ground, in this pendulum swing between control and release. But certainly in a musical, um, we know that you can become word heavy. You can become plotty. And if a musical does not explode every now and then uh, and, and on some kind of joyous level that is not in the words, maybe even not in the music, you haven't really released the show to happen. At the same time, if that release happens and the words are not delivering, then we're in real trouble too. So I guess I, I live in, in somewhere in the middle of this swing. Well, well I, do you yeah, want to I, do? I, I do. I, so much to me seems... Uh, to depend on where you are in the process with the material. Uh, particularly, I'm not talking now about musicals, but a drama, because certainly when I am in, in my early stages of process, when I have just done a first draft, I am not sure that I have yet found my structure or the structure that is going to work. Now at that point, input from actors, input from directors, for things that look fantastic to me on paper, but just are not going to work up on their feet, or that an actor finds a, an emotional line through muddled, a director finds it intellectually interesting, but certainly not dynamically possible. At that point, I'm extraordinarily open to inpo input from all of my people, from the, the uh, actors doing my developmental readings, a director who's been good enough to come on board with me as my process goes on. Once, however, I reach a draft that has gone into a formal production, that's a very another ma a different matter for me. Now, I know Marshall Mason has said, and I tend to agree with him, that going after structural changes on a play once you are in rehearsal is lethal. Th that you, you're through. That's the end of the play. Certainly, a writer is always open to a wonderful line. Uh, give me a new line, I'll adore it if you can find something to say better than me. Sometimes, I mean, and a writer usually is open to remote emotional redundancy. If I've said it 16 times, please tell me. You know, I may have forgotten I said it in line in Act 1, and here I go again in Act 2. Those are a different kind of cutting in the, in the actual formal rehearsal where I think the writer has got to sit at the top of this pyramid and say, here is your structure, you go and make it work. But even predating that first day of formal rehearsal, hopefully uh, the writer and his or her director have been in a close collaboration so that the structure of the play has been agreed upon. The line throughs of every scene hopefully have been agreed upon. That's not to say that what's going to happen once you hit <coughs> rehearsal hall, but certainly a very strong blueprint would have been laid out so that I find you can't, at least for me, I can't generalize and say I have to be in my room alone and I come in and here it is. I find with the play I'm in an ongoing process of developing my material and I guess I'm, other people better than me have said uh, writing finally is rewriting and certainly I think a play develops and evolves. I, so, Clinton, yes. I agree with what you're saying. I, my history has been one of working a lot with new plays as a stage manager and as a production supervisor, and now as a director. And I find that it is so important, if you're going to work in the collaborative uh, kind of arena, that that initial relationship between the director and that playwright is firmly established and you get as much of the structure under your, under your belt and on the page at that point before you call in anyone else. I often use a phrase when I'm working uh, with a, uh, other playwrights, 
I say you have to, we have to, right now, in this point, right at this section of the play right here, we have to make it actor-proof. So that whether, you get, whether you're fortunate enough to get a good actor or a bad actor, there is a road sign there that is, help, that is going to help them get through so that your intent, when you're, whether you're there or you're dead or whatever, is going to <laughs> always be correct. And I do the same thing, I use the same phrase with the playwrights, and I say, now make this section director-proof. <laughs> so that your intent, then the, the overall structure that you have been working on is not ruined, is not misinterpreted, because that happens so many times, particularly in new plays, once you do get into that pr production uh, aspect. Because it, the director will come in with a one, what seems to be at that moment a wonderful idea, or the actor will come in with a wonderful idea, and it does not work. And you have not, the playwright has not put the necessary roadblocks or the necessary exits off that ramp or into or led the, um, those other creators to the final intent of the playwright. And I think it is so important that that, that happens before, before you even go into rehearsal, before you bring on the other people. Marsha, how do you react to that? Well, you know, it's so strange. I, said, so, I don't know what it was in what you said that caused me to think this. You're going to think this is terribly bizarre. Um, but I, I used to talk about plays being pieces of machinery, sort of like a ski lift. Mm -hmm. You know, that <laughs> basically you get in uh, and you want to feel secure that you're not going to fall out. Uh, it's going to be all right. You're going to go up there and it's going to be a nice view. And that's the deal. Um, <laughs> and that, that you get in, people, people need to feel the thing start up right away needs to be a nice, nice, smooth climb, no like stopping to like dangle in the air. Uh, need to get up to the top of the mountain, open the doors, let people out, the end, go home. You know, so, you know, and that's how I used to think of it. And I still do think that's useful. But I was just thinking about actually what we do is make theme parks. Do you know? <laughs> um, in which the danger is that no matter how wonderful the environment, you can't just let people wander around in there. Uh, you know, or they'd spend all the, de all the time staring at the crocodiles and never get fed and, you know, never see all of the rest of what you've done. And that necessity of creating a, an environment where actors can live. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know, you were talking about roadblocks. You were talking about all kind of traffic things, weren't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's really what's critical. You make a whole world for them, but one in which there really is a path to follow um, that, that will take them past all of the important scenic moments. Yes, because once they get off the path and then you're in rehearsal, that's when they start dangling and, and really yeah. tampering with your structure. And they get scared. Because they don't see the yellow brick road. That yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've seen actors absolutely panic at the idea that somehow they had to solve this problem. Uh, that's just, that's a terrifying. I think Committee your theme park is idea worse. is very like uh, what, how people felt about Chekhov when he burst yeah. upon the world and he, he was giving them a world uh -huh. which, and they felt they were wandering around in the world they weren't sure how they were going to get out of it and, and he knew but they didn't know. Yeah. And I think Chekhov to this day is one of those playwrights who because of this uh, has the most varied productions, there, 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 all kinds of productions are possible in Chekhov. Fewer kinds of productions, plenty, are, are possible with uh, Ibsen. It was yes. much more rigorous and structured. He, his is a, a ski lift or a bridge or some yeah. terribly strong <laughs> thing, but with, with, with a certain number of ramps. Does Tom, I, I, I think, think, think it's Tom important that the writer retain the ultimate responsibility for, what, for that element. That's the thing that I fear is being eroded with the growing strength of the director, particularly in musicals. It's quite true. You get to a point, and if it's too many words, it doesn't work. But it should be, if the writer can't figure that out, uh, he shouldn't let somebody, somebody else shouldn't, that shouldn't be delegated to somebody else. If he can't figure it out, he bombs. He shouldn't, shouldn't make it. He has to learn on his own. He has to be responsible for his thing, ultimately. Uh, and that's what I fear is happening uh, a lot of times. And it's a matter of taste, how much you want to collaborate with a director beforehand. For some people, I guess it's very useful. For my own taste, I like to finish, really as finished as I think it can be finished, do my ultimate responsibility, then meet and see what we can go from there, you know. And, uh, but always 
bearing in mind that, that person ha you know, now the directors want increasingly to take a percentage of, uh, in the musical field of the writer's work. And it, there's just become a thing where the directors assign the, the writing, really, but like m movies. And yet, curiously <laughs> enough, we have fewer and fewer wonderful directors. Yes. I mean, the question that we all ask is, where are they? The Who's training them? Yes, and particularly, I guess that's true in the musical so, I mean, field. We are, we are <laughs> intimidated by this group that doesn't Perfect. exist. Well, was, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. I, I think that the frustration of, 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 of directors and choreographers becoming authors is, is one of the reasons why they have disappeared, because ah. the, the, the burden on them, at, which they took on by themselves, um, w w to create an entire entity when in fact they are not writers, is, is one of the, the great frustrations, I think, See, for so them. many times I, I've, I've found that so many times the director or the choreographer is given that script before they should get it, before it is mm -hmm. ready, before it is ready to be burned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they Absolutely. find themselves Absolutely. put in the position of having to be something that they're really not qualified to be. And they love be. it and they take and it and they yes, run with they take it, it and everything Because else. they put their name on the dotted line and they see the dollar signs in them. And all do, you the right. that, the, do you think that the, the plethora of, of film opportunities and television opportunities for directors pushes this kind of thing forward? To a certain extent, yes, I do. But I, 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 think it's, I think it's, it really gets back to the playwright, I feel. Uh, I found that so many playwright, many playwrights that I have worked with, they are too eager to get their works done. And so they give the work to a director or present it to a theater before it is ready. And um, that's where the problems start. Could we They're, hear from Herb on this? Mm -hmm. I'm very eager to hear what he has to say. You just about, you had your mouth open to say you something. Did? I was just oh, yes. say, it's he always more the best for Tom and I if we can write the show, the music and the lyrics and book, and then work with the director for a period and get his input and then do some more work on it. I mean, meetings are terribly important in the musical theater, I think, that people constantly communicate, and even after you're in rehearsal and while the show's being performed. And I think that very often doesn't happen in musicals after a certain point. And the, for us, the most important thing is that we all feel we're doing the same thing. And uh, I think uh, that's the most important period between a director and the, uh, the writers on a musical, is before you even go in rehearsal. And really all agree you're doing exactly the same show. But we always feel it's our job to come through with the basic point of view. That's part of the writer's job, the, the structure and also the imprint, what they call the, what do they call that thing now in musicals? Oh, you know. The concept. The concept. The concept. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I get separate uh, billing in the program. Conceived by. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, but now concepts are supplied too frequently, in my opinion, by directors. And really, I think, like everything else, it's all connected with economics of the theater in some way. That's down deep where the roots are. As costs go up, uh, there's less opportunity to learn and fail to grow, and there's more desire to find a magical person with a magical track record who will magically make it all work, you know? This is uh, a lot 30, of money. Thirty years ago, when directors were less important, it was a scandal that uh, Kazan had such an influence over Tennessee Williams that he was able to alter Williams' work. Also, however, making Williams possible because his personality was such that without Kazan, he wouldn't have been able to get the work done. So that began a kind of awe and respect for directors, which, which has been increasing over the years. And then Kazan himself, being a remarkable human being, and did a writer, become a and writer. A writer yes. As I said, then he went into writing. Yes. He did. He wasn't satisfied. But you don't really want to say that's what made Williams possible. Of course not. No, but possible. Well, you use the word possible. You know, to made make, it to make him producible. Sometimes, but don't say well, Kazan made Williams possible. No, it made him producible Williams was at extremely that time. possible before there was uh, a, without a Kazan. Uh, Just <laughs> pick up the plays and you'll find him very possible right oh, well, on the I'm, page. The, I'm the person who thinks oh. that Tennessee Williams is by far our greatest playwright. Oh, no, no, Ten no, times the playwright is Eugene so O'Neill. Like but no, I, meant, I should have said producible. <laughs> Producible. Because yeah. there were things that, that weren't working at that time in art in the theater as the theater then was. And Kazan said, this is how it's going to be. And Williams wasn't being distorted. He wasn't being twisted yeah. out, yeah. Of, his, yes. uh, out yeah. of his natural but shape. But he was being guided into uh, production. 
And, and uh, that's, that, that was not a contemptible thing for Kazan to do, and I don't mean that. Somewhere on that level, that always seemed like the healthiest kind of. If there's a word collaboration, I guess that's it. It's, it's when it gets past that I get But then Williams got lost later without so that kind yeah. of. He needed that. Uh, that the, was his The nature. best writing, no, I mean, uh, directorial writing that exists, in my opinion, are the published uh, Kazan's notes on Streetcar. It is an extraordinary thing. It's, it's in a number of books, including one called Dir Directors on Directing. But it is the most extraordinary analysis of a play that is like just structurally solid. He perceives on a poetic level, he perceives on a practical level, he breaks it down in a, into the spine, into the function of each scene, into each character. He sets up the forces at work in each character. He finds creative images for the actor. So on all the most, it's like a great writer being able to both think poetically and structurally at the same time. Uh, but this is an extraordinary man, was an extraordinary, great loss that he, in a way, because he's a much better director applying those gifts, in my opinion, than he was or is as a writer. But that's, that's a stunning achievement, yeah. full of wonderful things. For example, in the street, he kept saying to himself, don't tell Brando, don't tell Brando. Yeah. He had all of these bits of knowledge, and he didn't want to tell the actor, but just like give him, like feed it to him and so forth. So they're all great, they're all great directors. This is what the point is I was getting to. Too. Other directors, however, have left it much more to the writer. Harold Clerman was a favorite director of a lot of people, but he, he lent them emotion. He got excited. He stirred them up. But he wasn't really very good at this thing that Kazan could do in respect to making the structure work all the way through. I think almost nobody was is good at that. I think that's an extraordinary thing. And it's not what directors normally do or can do. I must say this was all after the play was written, Streetcar. And this is an analysis of the play, not how to make the play work, but how to like perceive the structure that was inherent in this poetic mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. if the, if the director playwright relationship in that collaborative, the early collaborative um, time period, it's really like I have to admire the playwrights that first they would give their child to a stranger, you know, because it's like sending your child to daycare in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know what's going to happen with, with your baby. And I, I always find that I have to approach directors really with a kid glove kind of uh, perspective because I don't want to damage the child. I, I really take it very personally because I admire them so much for taking the time and, and having that initial idea. And so I'm, I'm very apprehensive about even offering cuts, which is, I don't really like to oh, use is that, that word. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. I don't like to use that word, really, initially. You know, I don't, I say, why don't we, uh, did you think of rearranging this? Or, you know, and, and until I see that, the, that we have built up a certain kind of trust. And then once we have that, sometimes the playwrights go overboard and then they start cutting out the good stuff. You know, and then you have to bring them back. So it, it's a really, very delicate kind of relationship. It's more intense than a marriage. And it's, um, I have to admire them for allowing their work to be done, to be handled that way. I have a question to ask you or Richard or anybody here of, in terms of just what you're talking about in the very initial stages. I've had the experience, as have many of my friends who are playwrights, that you begin to interview a director, a potential director <coughs> for your play. And they will come over and they will say things to you like, this is a fabulous play. It's sad, it's funny. Your major character, I think, is one of the major characters that I've seen in contemporary literature. Uh, I think it needs trimming. I've got a couple of questions on the first act, a few on the guy. second. And you, and you know, and it's, it's like you get more and more built up. This person is fantastic for my play. They walk out the door. You say, I'll go with this director. You walk into the first day of rehearsal. They haven't got a clue as to what your play is about. Mm -hmm. Not a clue, you know? And th the problem for the playwright is finding out what, how do they know what your play is about? You shouldn't be seduced shouldn't at the beginning. Right? <laughs> shouldn't you know. audition a, a, a director? As you would of course actor? we do. You know, we go but, around and you watch you, a director's you work. What, you see what he's done. Once, twice, three, and four times. And, and the call back for the director should be the same as a call back for an actor, I would think. Can it work that way? <laughs> no, no, 
right, no, no, because what you do with a director, if you go around and you do see their work and you scout very hard, you know, and you'll, you'll see one show, you'll see another show. Seeing their work in one particular play does not necessarily mean that they have got a hook on your play. Or that they even did that play. Uh, or that they in, even in directed a, a, the play you've seen, exactly. Yeah. I think one of the things that... What you're, at, what you're talking about, I think, is, is really you have, you have to ask yourself, are we going to be able to speak the same language yeah. you know, in realizing, in translating this piece? And one of the things that I do constantly, I, I say many of those same questions uh, or make those same statements to, uh, to playwrights. But I find that when I work, one of the main questions that come out of, that I, I ask them is why. I constantly say why. Why did you do? Why did you make this choice? Why? And what if you made this one? And I think you have to listen to those kinds of questions more so and pay more attention to those so that you can understand immediately if the director is going to be that type of person who is going to sit down with you and explore all of the possibilities, sometimes things that you haven't thought of, and their ultimate ramifications. Because that, that's what I've, I've found that has happened too often when I've watched shows and worked on shows as a stage manager. I see, I'm in those meetings, and as a stage manager, I have to just kind of, um, <laughs> they're not asking the right questions of the playwright, and the play, so the playwright is not really responding. And down the road, you come into those problems with the actor who cannot get through this next, that yeah. transition uh -huh. because it is not on the page. Yeah, what you said about who has really directed the play, when you start <laughs> scouting plays, I remember becoming extremely interested in a certain director and was going to go with that director and then happened to be friends with an actress who had the leading role and I called up and I said it must have been a wonderful experience working with so and so and she burst out laughing and said I directed the play and, <laughs> and so and so directed the play and this is not, you know, you're smiling because it's not an exceptional situation. Also uh, because all actors say that about all uh, directors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, On uh, that note, exactly. we're going to break just for a few minutes and uh, then we'll come back again and we come back with questions from the audience and we just take a short break. You can stretch, but please don't go far away because we want to get on with all of this very, very important sharing of knowledge. So just stand up and sit down again as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay. We're continuing the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Today's seminar is on the playwright and the director. And before any ado, I just have to make one little short announcement, but a very important one. Brendan Gill, who has co-chaired the panel with Jean Dalrymple, had to go away. And he wants everyone to know he wasn't afraid of either the playwright or the director <laughs> in this. It was a previous engagement, and he was terribly sorry. He'll be with us again at, next, at the next seminar. And so now, Jean Dalrymple, who I'm sure wears so many hats that she can take the place of Brendan as well. Jean, would you continue? Yes, I wanted to ask Tom and Harvey what they think of the new, um, more or less new role of the director choreographer. Well, I think, in it, one. I think it can work. Again, I get back to that thing, if, we, if everybody will just talk to each other. And we had a very happy experience with a uh, director choreographer, Gary Champion, when we did I Do, I Do. He came told us, he said, I'm a benevolent dictator. He said, I want to have the last word, but we wanted to work with him. So we went into the, uh, the show with that understanding. But we did a lot of talking, and we wrote our version of uh, the musical version of the poor poster, which we, th we liked, and we presented to Gower, and he liked with some changes. So by the time we went to rehearsal, we had all agreed on a show. And then when we were out of town, whenever there were uh, things that weren't working, we would again talk, talk, talk for a long time back and forth, and we would write a number of things till we all agreed on uh, one number, and it wasn't put in the show ever until we all were pretty sure it would work. So that was a very happy situation of a director-choreographer. But you and didn't the, have... It's a, it's a thing I don't think we would do with everybody. I mean, it was very clear when we sat down with Gower in the beginning thing, he said, all right, as Harvey says, I am a benevolent dictator. I am benevolent, but I am a dictator. Don't work with me unless you're going to give me the final say. So it's something that I, with, because we want, I wouldn't normally do that, I don't think. But I will also say that he didn't say, well, now, nah, this is the way I want you to do this. This was the property 
that we all agreed to work upon, a two-character musical for Broadway, four-poster. He didn't say one word. Harvey and I broke it open. How can we get it out of the house? How can we make it presentational? How can we make it seem like something other than... We didn't really have to change our uh, work patterns right. to fit and, the situation. And he didn't dictate the form or structure. After that, as we had all of these meetings, he would say, I feel it's getting too heavy here, or even such things as, no, I'm sorry, she has 14 buttons, and we, on this dress, would you mind playing that again? And we'd, and we'd write music to cover for And he would say, Which no, wait a minute, that, 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 that's, that's right 12 music. buttons, you know, and, but we, I mean, he was, it was so thoroughly worked out in advance. His theory was, uh, he didn't want anybody, he didn't want Mary or Bob to come up with any question that he and Harvey and I hadn't already examined. He wanted to have thought of everything, so he seemed brilliant whenever they would ask him anything. Also, he didn't have great choruses to do great dances for no, and have to go off in another hall. When you know, he, that's what worries me about yes, the director-choreographer. But in some ways, that's better, really, to have a director-choreographer. What you really have a problem is when you have a choreographer who goes off in those other halls and they're out in a world of their own, really, true, and they, yes. they come back in and, you know, <laughs> and you think, there's this big lump here, yeah. this big uh, they, always, they always say it's going to be only three minutes and it always comes back 12 minutes. Yes, yes. that's right. Yes. How much were you influenced in a song and dance by the British production? I never saw the British production, so I... Purposely? Um, it wasn't running, so I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> I, had, I saw good. a videotape of some of it and... Uh, I'd heard it and everything. Uh, the, it was the premise of it was to do such a complete revision of it uh, and, and to uh, re reinvent it as a single piece as opposed to two separate pieces. That uh, the only real way to work on it was simply to start at the beginning. And, and uh, I thought the, the task of that <laughs> was to take this to, to take a musical structure which wasn't going to vary terribly much and change all of the superstructure uh, of, you know, do it completely backwards. Normally you do the structure first and then express it in music. Music was going to stay almost the same, but the events, the character, the theme, all, uh, all of the uh, nature of the play changed completely underneath that. So in that case, then, the director had full responsibility. Well, again, you see, I was, I was really brought on the show as, as a, an, an adapter, writer, and uh, that I was also directing it was, uh, was an extension of that. I was saying to uh, Marcia and uh, Shirley a while ago that I've only worked on shows in which I was a writer first and a director second, and I became a director really to do that. And that to me, the, the process, when we talk about collaboration, it isn't just so much a bunch of people working together, but really the forging of, of a single mind of the ski lift from a v variety of different minds. If we all had the same hill and we wanted to get from here to there, we'd all decide separately to do it differently. What a director does, or what at least what I try to do, is take all of the people who are working on the show and forge a collective vision, forge the, a structure that is made up of everybody's contribution but is not really anyone's contribution. I wouldn't have come in knowing exactly what I was going to end up with nor do I think, in, in many cases, do any other per people on the show. The show is, is something that comes together from a variety of different sources. And holding to that center is what the task is. Um, everything we've been talking about, really, even in plays, is uh, about a structure that is not necessarily expressed in words. It is something that exists. We know it exists because if you don't have it, it falls apart. But where it is, what it is, what it looks like, you know, is, is hard to define. And the task of living theater is to make that thing that doesn't exist so solid that nothing can de derail you from it. Uh, but I don't know that I agree with that. I think the structure should exist, at least implicitly exist, well, in the writer's work. I, can't mean, draw I, I feel the structure it. should be the, ultimately mm -hmm. the writer's responsibility. That's not to say the embellishment or the, the helping to strengthen it or something, but the, the writer should bring the structure if he brings anything, uh, because otherwise that's the source, that's the foundation, and the writer, it seems to me, should be the first level. 
Yeah, well, of course, I agree. You know, the, the writer is bringing your basic emotional line through, to talk in very academic terms, of the protagonist. That's what, that's what the writer is bringing, the emotional line through of the major character, right? Okay. Um, among other things, Among yes. other things. Among other things you've got to show up with. I mean. No, 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 no. But I'm saying that the, the, the straight line through structurally is going to fall on that central yeah. character in conflict with himself, in conflict with uh, someone else, in conflict with society, whatever. It's that, that dynamic, at least in a fairly traditional straight play I'm talking about now, that's going to provide the structure. Now, it isn't just words. It's not going to be just the words. I've got some kind of an echo here, um, as you said, because... It may be hung on the words, but the structure of that line through depends on more than the words. It mm. is the collaboration. Well, that I suppose would be true of, 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 of plays as, as well as musicals, uh, where yeah. the, the task of the director and the author, the actors, is to find the author's structure. It's on the simplest level. Yeah. What, what is the journey from here to there, and where do I contribute to it? But. Uh, in the case of a musical, at least, the structuring has a, a somewhat different meaning because in a musical, there are normally more, more elements. Mm -hmm. And in a musical, there are normally many, many scenes. And they're like, there's a kind of large and small, as well as the con when and how presentational. It's absolutely essential in a musical to find the structural structure, <laughs> uh, which, will, which will house something which is linguistically oriented, not real, doesn't make a pretense necessarily at realism in the usual sense of the word, and which is presentational, which won't seem strange for people to turn out and do things out directly, so forth. That, and also just like the breathing in a musical, it gets big, it's small. How, how long is it big and how long is it small? When do you go focusing in? When do you go focusing out? There's all of these structural elements that in the case of musicals frequently uh, in recent years, the directors have wanted to have that prerogative, and f frequently because I guess a lot of the writers don't, don't solve those problems. I maintain that it's the writer's job to solve those problems, and then later with the director to implement them and, and help correct imperfections in the st or structural flaws. But the structure is all. Everything is more important than anything in the musical. You, uh, but even when you're talking about what you just talked about, in each individual scene, is there not a dramatic event? And in that dramatic event, have not the characters changed emotionally by virtue of that event having happened? Which is what I'm talking about when I talk about structure and emotional line through. And well, if it doesn't happen, then haven't you gone astray from the structure? Even when you say big, small, big, small, out to the audience, wherever you are. Well. I think that would frequently be true. I don't believe Not that always. it's always true. No. no. Right. And it may be different with <coughs> plays. I don't know from plays. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia, you know from plays. Yes. <laughs> and you started by saying you were ambivalent about your feelings about writing in every direction. There are playwrights who feel very strongly about it. Bob Anderson, for example, writes in every single every single direction in there on, 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 and a script and expects it to be followed that way. And I remember on one of our uh, seminars he said that on Tea and Sympathy he was in London and he saw the, uh, the play and, and the part where his direction said tenderly but firmly gather the boy into your arms. And he saw this woman go mm, like that and he said it was very good actress doing it. When he saw the director, he said, but it says tenderly but firmly. Well, he that's said, tenderly and firmly in England. In England. <laughs> and also said he, I didn't want to be accused of copying what was being done. Ira Levin says, absolutely not one word can be changed on this. Isabel, you haven't asked your favorite question. How did these wonderfully creative people get started? <laughs> well, can we do it quickly? Because I think it's important we, for all the people that are out here. Where did you come to writing? Where did you come? You answered that beautifully in how you came to directing, and I believe that's the way you should come to almost anything by experience and starting and knowing every part of the theater. And that's one of the reasons of these seminars that there is a crossover and a sharing of the responsibilities. But could we go quickly through here and Jean's right to bring us back? <laughs> Well, I wanted, Back to the beginning. I wanted to be a set designer. 
and uh, uh, nobody that I knew wrote anything to go into the sets that I wanted to design. <laughs> so I began to write things so that they would go into the sets. And then um, after that, other people could write, but nobody else could write lyrics. So I started doing that, and then I found we were in, pr in a production of a show and I was in my room writing lyrics and everybody else was having fun and I wondered how I ever got here. And that's when I came back out and decided to start directing. Marcia? Um, my, my answer is really very simple. I, I finally realized that I was unemployable. <laughs> um, that I could get uh, jobs very, very easily. And people hired me for, oh, almost 10 years to do almost anything. Uh, and um, I would reach a point with, the, with that work. And these were interesting jobs. I mean, jobs? I, you know, I worked in a mental hospital for two years, and I, um, I taught the fifth grade for two years. Uh, I taught film for two years. You know, I ran a federal arts program. For, I mean, you know, nice <laughs> things to do, yeah. things that the were world needs. Were you lighting at the same time? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I reached a, uh, a point. I mean, yes, of course, uh, back behind this is this, uh, is this desperate desire to be a writer and an absolute conviction that uh, writers didn't come from the kind of families that I came from. They didn't come from the part of the world. If you were a writer from Kentucky, you were from the mountains in Kentucky. You weren't from Louisville. Um, and so for a long time, I was protected from actually the possibility that I could write for a living. And um, that provided me with almost 30 years of useful life out in the world, uh, for which I'm very grateful now. Um, and I began to write, uh, I mean, I wrote Gary Out when I was 29. So, I mean, I talk about being afraid of being 30. Right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, what, what, that, what I realized at the end of that time was that simply not, I hadn't been able to find anything that was hard enough to do. And I am enough of a just natural sufferer and um, <laughs> that, that I wanted the hardest thing. Um, I also realized that I don't like to be outside and I really can't, can't get along when I have to work with other people. Uh, <laughs> like in the theater. <laughs> well, it's, it's a trouble for me, you know, that I'm really very, that more than anything on the earth, I love paper. Um, <laughs> So you can see this is a very rational decision. <laughs> this is all that's left for me to do. I'm so, I'm so glad you finally came to that decision. Yeah. Uh, well, I came of age uh, before the women's lib movement when there were no women playwrights, or at least I hadn't heard of any. Uh, I'd heard of two male playwrights, Shakespeare and Thornton Wilder, who'd written the role of Mrs. Gibbs for me in the high school senior play. And uh, <laughs> I had a very keen interest in the theater. I had a keen interest in writing. Nobody ever dreamed of telling me to be a playwright. So I headed out to be both a professional actress and a fiction writer. And I studied acting with Alvina Krauss at Northwestern. I started to work professionally as an actress. I published a novel. I felt very schizophrenic doing this. It didn't seem to be my calling. I turned around and I began to teach college and work towards a PhD in dramatic criticism, which I found was answering something. And nobody put any of this together. I couldn't put it together. I had wonderful mentors all the way along. Nobody ever said, you're writing plays, or why don't you write plays? And I went on my merry way until 1975, when I was in, working on a PhD, I was in a creative writing seminar at Columbia, taught by Richard Elman, and I was bringing in chapters of a second novel, and something was in the air in 1975 that was very different. And Richard Elman and my peers in the class said, Shirley, you're writing a play in disguise. Why don't you turn this into a play? I dropped out of the fiction seminar. I turned it into a play called The Contest in six weeks. And I sent it off with no agent uh, to four or five regional theaters. And the Alley Theater picked it up uh, four weeks after I sent it and gave me a major production. Good. And that's how I started. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, many years <coughs> after uh, I had been doing all these other things. But you needed all the other things to get to I that. did need the other things, but, but there was something in the air that was different that said women could be playwrights. Uh, and it had never occurred to anybody. <coughs> And I think that the roles we were in in those years were very different mm -hmm. 
from what's happening now. There was a, if I can say a word here, there was a woman called Rachel Crothers. She wrote 26 hits in 26 years. She began in 1904. <laughs> I didn't well, out. No, I, I was. History. My roots are rural, like like uh, Marcia's. I'm from Iowa, and we didn't oh. hear <laughs> right about William Hilton and Rachel Crothers out there. Herb, how did you start? I, I think well, my situation is not much different from uh, Marcia's. I just um, I was essentially unemployable. Uh, <laughs> um, I was um, an illustrator and a sculptor for a long time. I was around 26 or 7, and that's what. And I did a comic strip for a while. I noticed that the balloons in which the characters spoke were getting larger than the drawing. Literally, the feature editor at the Chicago Tribune wrote to me saying, "The first three panels of this Sunday's. I, I remember the letter even. There are no drawings. It <laughs> <laughs> was just." It was just and he said, I think that's dialogue. The <laughs> um, um, fact is, um, it's always risky to describe these moments because this may mean only something to me and all of you will stare at me mysteriously afterwards. But as, um, as uh, the rest of you were talking about how you started, I do remember a specific uh, time many years before I was an illustrator. I, um, because one of those um, of, of sort of egotistical origin, but I always think it's sort of a healthy form of it anyway. Uh, 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 and it's what I remember often, uh, um, and I've forgotten, and there it is the last couple of years back in my head. I worked for about three years for a place called the ABC Vending Corporation when I was in high school, uh, checking coats and selling orange drink in the theaters, uh, mostly in the court and the Morosco couple of other theaters, but I was there for, with Dominic DeLuise, who's now uh, has been for a long time an actor. The two of us were sort of a team, sold an orange drink. <laughs> and uh, we were working at a play called The Constant Wife, a uh, Somerset Mom play, one of those perfectly structured drawing room, and, and terrifically done. Uh, um, and it was one of those plays where there's, it was an era of a kind of play where there's a very important letter in the second act, and it was a, wonderful older actress, Gladys George, came out and found a letter. And there was this long silence. She finds the letter. And so Dominic and I were working the balcony. This was the National, which was then called the, the Billy Rose, which is now called the Needle Landing. And it has steep sort of balcony. And I was 15 or 16, and I was given to having nosebleeds and not admitting it because I thought it wasn't masculine to bleed. <laughs> and um, I gave change to somebody during the intermission after the first act, and there was some blood fell on it, and I looked like it wasn't couldn't possibly much. <laughs> and they did not notice the blood. And during that first uh, scene, Gladys George came out, opened this letter, there was a great silence, and someone, in fact, the name, was, the name that was used was Marsha. A man said, Marsha, there's blood on my money. <laughs> and, uh, in the mezzanine. And was, the audience paid no attention <laughs> to the, almost the rest of the second act. <laughs> and I'm upstairs with, with Dom with our boxes of orange drink, and I said, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I had arrested this audience with, uh, now I later found further uses for my blood, it turns out. <laughs> We're about to go to questions now, and, and I think you're going to have to answer to how you started from our questioners. That, that, that I know that there are some of them that are asking that. One of the things I'd like to have answered, too, is how you feel about Broadway and off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. And uh, I know you two, I pretty much know how you feel, because the Fantastics is, we proudly point to uh, our answer to the mousetrap in London, and, and um, I think that it's important to see how most playwrights feel about that. And so now we'll start asking our questions, and would you like to come up? Please. Um, this this uh, question is directed to Marcia Norman. Uh, you've written about subsidizing the need to subsidize the playwright. 
Um, what do you think of the new approved production contract and how that helps the playwright up front? The, uh, the APC, the approved uh, production contract, is uh, there's probably more chatter about that now than just about anything else uh, in, the, in the business. Um, and what I feel about, about its provisions and about it as a whole um, is that it, this is something that we have to try now. We have to see how this works. Um, there have been, you know, there's all kind of controversy now among people saying, oh, I'm not going to sign that. I want the old contract back. I want to go to profit pools. I, you know. And I think that it's the, it's the uh, at least it's the general feeling in my club that, uh, that we need to try this for a while. This has some, offers some substantial benefits uh, to writers, not simply the great advances. Uh, I mean, I think that the, that the primary benefit of the new contract <coughs> is the change in the subsidiary arrangements. I mean, we all know that, that you live on, I mean, it's, you live on the money that comes in from around the world from the stock and amateur productions. Um, and I think that the contract is so radical, uh, so radically different from what we've had before that it's created a lot of controversy. Uh, clearly, the industry isn't going to survive uh, unless there are, unless there's some major rethinking about who takes money when and how. Uh, we need, we, I mean, I could go down a great long list, which would just get me quoted in the newspaper, which I don't want, about, you know, what we really need in the industry. We need concessions from everybody, basically, um, or we aren't going to have any Broadway. And I think that the fact that uh, the economics alone, that is what's the matter. Um, where that has come from, most of us know uh, who, who has caused that. And uh, we now need to find a way to, to, to straighten that out. And I think the APC is the Dramatist Guild's uh, approach, basically. We've taken one step. We've said, okay, we'll do this. We'll cut that royalty to 5%. But we'll protect ourselves at the beginning and protect ourselves when there is money. Uh, now it's time for every other factor in the equation. The unions, the set people, the directors, the producers, everybody else needs to make a similar move in the direction of, um, of, a, of a continuing life for Broadway. I think that's very important. I think that's going to... I like, also would like to quote you, even without your permission, to something that I think is very important and could be added to that ingredient. And, uh, one of the best speeches I've ever listened to at the New Dramatist, in which he said, support the plays which don't work so we can stay alive to write the plays which do. And I think the only way to do that is by everybody taking that step that you're doing. So we can have plays that ne not necessarily are blockbusters or get the great big ticket, but are plays that people are going to go to see. And I think you've, you've addressed yourself very clearly to that and very strongly. Would you ask your next question? This is to Mr. Davis. After college and grad school, where do you go to learn directing? Are there any specific names of people and theaters that you would recommend or that anyone here would recommend? My God. Where do you go? You go to the, the nearest theater that you want to work with and hound them and hound them and hound them. Or if you can find a playwright and build up that relationship of trust and understanding, and then you will have a property to take to the theater and say, oh, I have to happen to have Marsha's next play here. Uh, do you think you'd be interested? And you've built up a relationship of working so that you go along with the play sometimes. And you just have to start beating a lot of doors, making a lot of uh, ketchup soup sometimes. But it, it takes time. It really does. Is there one theater or two theaters um, more than any other that you would recommend? Um, I would, I can't really say recommend theaters. I would mm -hmm. say um, to work, to look a lot in the, at regional theaters, the smaller theater companies, and also possibly concentrate on those theaters that do a lot of new plays. Because you will find that, it's been my experience that the theater companies that do the, what I call the war horses, they're not necessarily going to be looking for that new director, that first-time director. 
because there's so much involved, particularly in terms of financing and finding the name that is going to attract the audience to make the play work, as in uh, box office. Thank you. Now, this question is for Richard Maltby. Uh, do you think that a playwright should direct his or her own play? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It really depends entirely on the temperament of the playwright. Uh, uh, many writers that I know have no patience for the uh, uh, turmoil that actors go through to produce their performances and don't want to know about it. Um, you have to be very patient and very involved with a process that in some cases is antithetical to what the author was doing as an author, as an actor tries to come to a performance. So uh, it's entirely in the temperament of the of the playwright. If they're willing to do that and and are willing to be flexible enough to take to go through that process with the with the actor to, to arrive back at their play, then then by all means, because obviously no one knows more about the uh, play than the playwright. But um, Many playwrights simply don't want to do that and, and are annoyed <laughs> at the process that actors go through. Thank you. Yes. Hi, this is to Mr. Gardner. I just had a play produced. Can you hear me? I just yeah. had a play produced off Broadway, and it was primarily Patricia. I just had a play produced off Broadway. It was primarily a series of monologues, a few vignettes, and people came up and said, oh, great, great, but I'd love to see these people talk to each other. So I'm scared that once I get at my typewriter, one character will just be going, oh, really? Oh, so that the other person can talk. And I wondered if you had some suggestion as to how I could practice when I'm writing not to write in a monologue so that the other character can get his objective too. Does that make sense? Oh, sure it does. <laughs> okay. So you're basically, your question is, how do you write a play? No, no, I mean, <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the monologues worked well, and they're on the desk of Samuel French right now. Someone's reading, but I just wondered how, they said, I'd love to see a full length and see these people talk to each other, and the thought of making these people talk to each other scares me. It's nice to just have them come out and do their little monologue, and people go, oh, and laugh and be moved. But when they have to talk to each other, I just don't know. Well, what's wrong with what you did do? I mean... Well, they said we want something more conventional. Yeah. We can't publish this because we want something more conventional. If it, does it feel like it's a play to you? Yes. Yes. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I, my, my only... Um, you know, my only choice has been to, uh, for myself to... to Draw bubbles. To just listen, to uh, to try to hear what it is I want. <laughs> I'm not always listening. Uh, and, and maybe this is what you want, regardless of what you've been told. Uh, usually, uh, I'm, I'm maybe it's true for the rest of us here writing, uh, when it seems play-like, is something there are two characters, the simplest, simple-minded rule I have when you find two people who truly disagree with each other, they will tend to start to talk. Uh, uh, but that isn't to say that you, you, may, be, you may have some uh, form that is very attractive to you, and why shouldn't it be attractive also to an audience? I, I don't hear anything wrong with what you're doing, is, is what I'm saying. So I don't have to try to write No, you're not a puppeteer, you know? The That's idea is not to take these people who clearly don't have anything to say to each other, only want the attention of the audience, you do, the, you, it is not your job to turn them around and force them to talk to each other. I mean, when it's time for you to write a play, you'll write about some other people, some people like Herbs who do want to talk to each other. And then you'll have trouble getting them to shut up, and they won't pay a bit of attention to you. That's when it's fine. No, thank you. Oh, I'm just saying, don't, don't decide you're doing anything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Be careful. I'd like to address my question to Shirley Laura. I'd like to know what is your strategy uh, in writing the, your, the opening scene of your plays? Uh, or if you have one. Yeah, I don't, I don't work with a strategy. Let me say that uh, when I first began to write, I used to write a play from beginning to end. I would start off at the beginning of the play and move forward. 
as I have gone on with my craft, I now find that I go very far into the play. I move, I move with sometimes the climactic scene to the end and then go back. And uh, there are writers that write, a lot of writers write the way I do, a lot of writers write beginning to end, but certainly there's no strategy. It's a much more maniacal, <laughs> much more emotional kind of situation. And in order to get me going, or in order to, when you're talking about two characters facing each other, who dislike each other, who like each other, uh, for me, I instinctively push them to their extremes before it starts taking fire for me. And then I push that on and on. And then sometimes I'll reel back to the beginning. Now, where were they earlier on? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Joseph Holloway. This is also from Miss Lauro. And my question is, what contributions has a director or have directors made to your work? I think they've made enormous uh, contributions. Uh, I'm a playwright that works very closely with directors. I am highly collaborative, which is not to say that I don't mother my productions and don't sit on top of them and don't feel that I'm up there, because I do. Um, I think directors have helped me manifest my ideas into specifics that will work on a stage. I think if I, if, I, if I got it narrowed down to that, they have helped me change intellectual ideas into theatrical dynamics. Um, they have helped me understand the actor's process much more than I used to understand it. Um, I think maybe I, maybe I would say that mostly the contribution is in terms of setting limits and turning something into intellectual into something that's operable on a stage. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for just two more quick questions. This is for Herb. Um, my name is Jonathan Larson. And my question is, uh, is it the playwright's job to try and attract the TV baby audience? And if so, how does he do that? <laughs> is, it the, is it the author's responsibility, did you say? Mm -hmm. I mean, TV baby, people who have grown up with... People you who are... You don't mean little teeny television set. You <laughs> mean people who have grown up with television. Yeah. <laughs> you mean to get them into the know. theater I, away from television? To me, it's, it's, I, uh, the only, it, there's only obligation, if there is one, is to overcome them. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I have a question for Marsha Norman. What is the legal process that a new playwright must follow to have their play produced? The legal process? Mm -hmm. You mean the copyright and uh, you want to ask? Well, well there's a very, isn't there a very simple, the, the dramatist skill is, is your protection, is it, in the sense of where would you start before that? Well, if, if, if the question is primarily about copyright, uh, you know, you, if How you, protect your script, if you say mean? copyright 1985 Susan Roberts, right, that's good enough. That will hold up. If that's on the front, in other words, that's, I mean, that we still do have a certain amount of common law copyright in this country. So if you say 19, com, co, it has to go just like that, though. It, you can't be your own original version of that phrase. Um, basically, that's all that you need to protect you from plagiarism or stealing or whatever. You, you, you need serious protection in terms of what kind of contract you make with the producing organization. That's where you need to use some form of either the standard dramatist skills contract or you need to consult with a wonderful lawyer so that you, for example, don't give away uh, subsidiary rights participation that will mean your play will never be done by anybody else, um, so that you don't give it over to them completely, uh, you know, so that you give them, real, basically the deal that you want to make is you can produce this play for these many times for this much money, and that's it. <laughs> you know, you don't want any... I'll give you this for half of my royalties from now on, which is what people do. I mean, there are a number of productions, just horror stories of wonderful plays languishing out there in the country because 
they no longer have sub sufficient subsidiaries attached to them uh, so the producers can make their money back. Isn't uh, there one step on first when you to write that on your on your script that you mail it to yourself? Isn't that proof to that you put it in a novel and see that it's mailed back to you with a date mark? Or I something? think you know. I Is think that, that's really just voodoo. A lot know. of us do that, <laughs> uh, but I think that basically, you know, lawyers are be work better than the post office. And I mean, I I do. I think mean, before you can get before you get it. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the driver skill. Quite incidentally, there's a little ad here for the guild. I mean, the Dramatist Guild does have a free number. You do not have to be a member of the Guild in order to call. Uh, the Guild is there to protect writers. Uh, at, and not that, ev not that the world is filled with monsters who want to take advantage of them, but in the event that one of the rare monsters should be in your neighborhood. Um, That's a very important note. Yeah. Thank you very much for bringing that up. And this brings once more not enough time, not, an, not ever enough time for everything that wants to be asked of the kind of people that we have on the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. I want to make one quick little observation that the American Theatre Wing is a service organization and we thrive and work with volunteers. We need volunteers for the office, we need volunteers to go out to our hospital shows. On our seminar today are the authors of the Fantastics, and I'm, I talk about the continuity of the theater and, and the continuity of the American Theater Wing, and I think that exemplifies it. Fantastics, with every cast, has gone out to an American Theater Wing hospital show. They've gone to our schools, our Saturday Theater for Children's Schools, and now we have them here at a seminar, and it's very gratifying indeed. And to be here at the the American Theatre Wing seminars, to, which are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, is indeed a wonderful service, and it is, I'm speaking for the American Theatre Wing and my board of directors. I'm very grateful to everybody on, the, on our panel, and I'm grateful to you, the audience, for the kind of things you do.